Uh, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this beautiful evening. Thank you, Father, that you have given us another opportunity, another day, another evening to praise you, to worship you, and to come before you, Father Lord, to meditate on your word. Be with us, speak to us, Father Lord, and enrich our hearts, our minds, and souls, Father Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, for today, the meditation we are doing is Romans chapter 7, verse 14. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Uh, when we read or when we read Romans, we often find that um, Paul has played with words or he has done a lot of talking and there's a lot of uh, rhetoric. He asks questions, he answers them on his own. And, uh, and sometimes I find that when I read Romans, it's like you have to read it a few times again and again before you understand what he's trying to say. And there are just few points that I would like to bring out. And, and when he says, it's believed that Paul was, um, especially this chapter, these few verses in, uh, from 11 to 25, it's autobiographical. It's probably he wrote it uh, when he was thinking about his blinding experience in Damascus or his journey to Arabia. And Paul here is a redeemed person and he questions whether he's truly redeemed and how so. Why should he be anything special or apart from others? And he wants to reflect on his experience over here in these verses. Uh, we cannot take just uh, 7.14 uh, on its own. We need to read before and after to find what he is saying and why he is coming to the arrival that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. And when you read a little before, in the 12th verse, it says that, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. The law on its own is very pure, it's holy, it's righteous, and it is good. And all those who followed in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, they were all following the law. It kept them from sinning, uh, but they always felt that, do I measure up to it? Do we measure up to the law? Am I really fulfilling the law by doing this and this and this? And over here, Paul is rambling and saying that, can I say that I am sinful in nature, so I am sinning? Can I absolve myself? Like, can I put the sin apart from me and say that I am sinning? It's because the sin is in me, but it's not I am who is sinning. But then he finds that, yes, and if you read the next few verses, he goes on to say that, I try doing things which I don't want to do, I do things which I don't like, and so on and so forth. And it's often like this for us, do we measure up? We follow, we follow what we read in the Bible, we are spiritual, we try following the law, but most of the times we do not measure up to it, because the sin makes us do things that is against the law. There's always a war in our minds, in our souls, and Sometimes we feel that if I'm following the law, am I good enough? But then I know that I'm filled with sin and I'm sinful nature is with me. I'm a prisoner to sin and death. And there's no, seems to be no rescue at all. And in life too, we often try this measuring up or following the ideal thing is always a struggle for every one of us. Either we are measuring up yes, we try to measure up to God's word and his standards. But when we go through in life, we're trying to measure up to our standards of our parents, our relatives, and what the society wants from us. And it's like almost everybody has the measures and we feel we are struggling hard to measure up to it or meet up to somebody's expectations. But here, and we always fail. And Paul says, that, and how much more should we feel when we actually, we always find ourselves lacking and wanting when we come to Christ. And uh, he, say, he also goes on to say that in spite of all this, when our Paul was, how do I say, he was a religious man, he always followed the law to a T, and he delighted in the law, and he took pride in that. But even then, he found that he was always wanting. And this measuring up, yes, can I measure up? No. But does it stop over there? 
because he says that in 23, and, uh, but I see another law at work in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and make me, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. W what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from the body of death? And the answer is, in the next verse, he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself in my mind, I'm slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave of the sin. In any time, at any point of time, I'm going to be a slave of sin. But when Christ comes, is the spirit of the Lord that delivers me from my old nature and producing righteousness in me. And, and you are, he also says the law is like everybody who follows or like the law is there for us to be going in a certain path that God wants us to. But we often find that it doesn't set us free. The law in itself doesn't have the power to set us free. And it is God who sends his son to make that condemnation taken away from our lives because Christ comes to condemn our sins, that sinful nature in us, and make us free. And, and then he goes on to say that I meet the measures or everything that the law wants me to be. The law, he doesn't remove the law because the grace of the Lord is there. The law is very much there. It's still valid. It's still there. And if we read in chapter uh, 8, and he says in verse 3, he says, In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. So all our measurements, all our meeting a standard of the law or the standard of what Christ wants us to be, it is the spirit of the Lord, only the spirit of the Lord can that help us come to him and where our requirements, our requirements in Lord are met. And, and yes, when we said yes earlier that we did, we did not measure up to him, now we can boldly come to Christ because he condemns the sinful nature in us and he transforms us. When he says, I'm carnal and I mean like I'm a sin to slave, that is being transformed because now I'm not carnal and I'm going to live in the spirit of the Lord. And the sinful nature is condemned and I am fulfilling the law, which is righteous, good, and holy. And Joseph Hart, in 1712, in him, come ye sinners, poor and needy. Uh, I'll just read a couple of verses from that. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. I will rise and go to Jesus. He will save me from my sin. By the riches of the merit, there is joy and life in him. We are called today to come to him from wherever we are, and if we feel that we have failed or we find ourselves wanting, let us rise and go to Jesus because he is able to condemn the sinners in us and make us pure, pure holy, righteous, and that which is good and help us fulfill the law, which is the requirement for what he is saying. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it's because of you and your grace and through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we can come boldly to you and where we can purify our lives, our thoughts, our meditations, our wanderings of our mind, Father Lord. Many a times we falter, we fail, we bumble around, Father Lord, but by your Spirit, you enable us to fulfill the law, Father Lord, that which is holy, righteous, and good, and that we might move away from the carnal nature, from the sinful nature, to be pure and holy in your sight, Father Lord. We come today to you as sinners with all our iniquities, with all our failings, Father Lord, and that we might find relief in you, Father Lord, that we might find life in you, Father Lord, because it is you who gives us life who makes us holy, Father Lord, and in every step of our way, as we go through life, at moments when we find that, yes, Father Lord, what a wretched man I am, what a wretched woman I am, Father Lord, what a wretched person I am. This might be our thoughts many a times, Father Lord, but we come to you, you take away all that wretchedness because of your mercy, Father Lord. 
Yes, Father Lord, our sins are many, but your mercy is more, Father Lord. We trust on your mercies to save us, to redeem us, Father Lord, that we might meet the requirements of the law, to stand before you holy, pure, uncorruptible in this world, Father Lord. And we pray that this be a blessing for our church, for our children, for our generations, Father Lord, that each one of us come to you, Father Lord, as families, as individuals, to you, Father Lord. Help everyone to rise up and come to you, Father Lord. And Lord, we thank you for doing this for us, for blessing us as families, as individuals, as a church, Father Lord, where we can come and praise and worship you, Father Lord. Thank you, Father, for doing this. In Christ's most precious name we pray, amen.